A lot of your work is focused on the relationship between the macroeconomic data and the markets. Yes. Uh, what is that work telling you? How is that informing uh, what you're seeing today in terms of the current environment? Yeah, so I've been very interested in, in the interplay between long-term uncertainty um, in terms of where the macro economy is growing. Are we, in, are we involved in secular stagnation or are we going to grow our way out of it? Um, and, and when that induces caution and when that indu induces boldness, when it makes asset values firm and when it makes the asset values much more fragile. So we've seen a run up in the stock prices recently, which I think is um, uh, driven in part by, say, um, ch changes in the tax code and uh, other temporary optimism. But I also think these values can be quite fragile and, and, and would not take a lot to knock them down. So possibly not as sustainable as, as some may, may suggest. But Correct. despite the, the, the synchronized global environment we're seeing in terms of trade yeah. volumes and the rest. Yeah. So I, I you know, it's, it's, of course, my, my interest in research is all about uncertainty. So I can't tell you for sure that the values are firm, or for, but, but there's a different possibility. There's some fragility attached to them. Something you've also pointed to in the past is uh, talking about systemic risk and yes. saying that it's actually very difficult to define, uh, almost impossible to measure. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is because, of course, it is front and center in terms of priorities for the Chinese government. Yes. Uh, is it then a fool's errand for them to try to clamp down on what they call systemic risk if you cannot measure it and you cannot define it? Yeah, so I guess my views on systemic risk is that we, we as an academics, have a lot to learn. You know, there's been some progress done recently, and we have more to learn about it. And and that, um, given our knowledge base, that uh, that approaches to systemic risk, that I think that more broadly, a systemic uncertainty ought to focus on much more simple type type of policy responses, and not ones that are loaded with complexity. In terms of the situation in China, I guess my biggest concern there is the following. Um, uh, if we want to look at investments in new enterprises and new businesses, a lot of that uh, is going to be coming through the shadow banking sector and not through the uh, state-owned banks, which, are, which, which don't have a good record in, in, in those type of investments. And so if you have a financial stability board that's going to try to clamp down on shadow banking, you run the risk of closing down some of the uh, potential sources for growth in the future. And so I think that's a, a challenge that China in particular is going to be facing going forward. And that's a potential risk that possibly markets are underpricing at the moment? Uh, well, but, well, they could be underpricing it, yes. But, but I think this, you know, to, to, the extent we're, to the extent we're want to see where the growth in China is going to occur over the long haul, I think, I think this kind of how do we get the financing to the really new ideas and innovative ideas coming through China is important. And I, and I think the state-owned banking sector channeling it through that is, is, is not the right way to do it. If you had the ear of the central government here in China, what would you say the right policy mix should be, the priorities uh, for the government now? My own view is that the, uh, the more that we could um, uh, allow for financing and financial opportunities and investment to take place outside the state-owned sector, I think that would be better because I, could, I, th I think it's got a better and more promising track record going forward. Are they making the right moves on opening of capital markets with things like the Bond Connect, the Equities Connect, and the moves to liberalize some of the financial services? So I believe moves like that are potentially valuable, yes. But more should be done? Uh, well, I'm always, you know, I'm a pretty strong advocate of opening financial markets more generally globally, and I think that can be quite, you know, very productive. Uh, in terms, more broadly, a key focus has been the monetary policy normalization that we may start to see now from the Fed, from the yeah. BOJ and the ECB. Yeah. Uh, how is that likely to feed through into the markets? That seems to be a key question. Does there anything in your research tell you uh, what we might expect to see? So my own views on this is, is, is that there's been a lot of focus on monetary policy in isolation. And a lot of the key challenges I see when it comes to uncertainty has to do with the, how the monetary policy inter is, 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 and is a big influenced by the fiscal challenges going forward. You know, like, the, you know, like for, the, for instance, the U.S. continues to have long-term fiscal challenges. And I think it's, it's, it's very hard to uh, ask monetary policy to be solving all the problems when, indeed, I think that the fiscal challenges are really important and how we oversee financial markets is, um, um, is really important. So I have a very hard time thinking about monetary policy in isolation and, and and, and, and I personally think that the more attention is devoted instead to things like fiscal challenges and, and uh, financial market oversight, that that's, that that's very productive.
So it's your view that generally there's been an, an over-reliance on monetary policy um, in recent years? I think a lot of monetary policy makers understand the limits to what they can do, and they understand that they need uh, that, 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 that there's fiscal challenges out there which, which will have important impacts on things. They just don't have the ability to address those problems. And the press, unfortunately, finds monetary policy easier to understand than the, some of the fiscal challenges. So there's a tendency to write much more about that. In terms of geopolitical risks, in this region, of course, front and center is North Korea. Are markets able, should they try to price in geopolitical risks? How can they? Yeah. Well, I think they have no choice but to price them in. Uh, I think it's a very challenging thing to be doing because to make assessments about what, what the, uh, uh, to quantify the uncertainty which are faced there is really truly quite challenging. Um, so I, uh, I think I, I think markets are probably struggling a little bit with exactly how to do this. And, and uh, uh, as, as like we as economic, academic economists, uh, in terms of how to fully quantify the uh, uncertainty attached to that, is, you know, can be quite challenging. But markets have to do it. I mean, you know, they're facing you know, that's, that's, that those are real risks going forward. Um, I'm hopeful that the North Korea risk per se is, is more bluster than real than a real risk. But I, I think more generally, kind of overall policy and political uncertainty is a very important uh, component and a potential important drag on the uh, overall economy. And do you think markets are underpricing those risks at this stage? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to give a firm statement on whether they're, that, whether they're underpricing it because I think it's a challenge on exactly how to price it. Uh, but but I do think it's a, uh, in terms of the overall macro economy, I think it's an important source of uncertainty. There's been a, a bit of discussion, or a lot of discussion, I should say, about the implications of the tax overhaul in the yes. U.S. And just in the last few days, we've heard from uh, James Bullard, for example, saying he does think it could buoy the economy, whereas uh, many others would say it's going to have a negligible effect. Where do you stand on that? What kind of stimulative effect, if any, do you think the tax cut is likely to have on the so, so I can believe in the short run that the tax cut can have a stimulative effect. What I'm concerned about the tax policy, though, is the following. Um, uh, there's an opportunity to, to simplify the tax code, and they have not done that. This tax code looks very much as complicated, if not more complicated, than the previous ones. And I think there's an opportunity that, that, that's, been, that's been missed here. I think it also really doesn't address the long-term fiscal challenges. There's a promise in the tax code that down the road, in order to make things look fiscally responsible, we'll, we will increase taxes on the, on the middle class sometime in the future. That's not going to happen. That's just a political ploy. And so, uh, um, and so the real challenge I see is how will we address the uh, fiscal shortfalls over the long haul, which I think there could be, which I personally believe could be substantial. Uh, are there specific policy measures that you could point to that you would like to see in an ideal world the Trump administration initiate to try to address some of those challenges? I would like to see them to roll up their sleeves, Congress, uh, um, as well as the president, roll up their sleeves and say, how are we going to address the long-term fiscal challenges coming through health, you know, uh, public provision of health care and the like, uh, and, and how, how are we going to address the potential shortfalls when it comes to um, collecting taxes versus the uh, programs which we're, which, which we're seeking to um, uh, uh, support. And I do believe things like um, uh, infrastructure development in the U.S. could be quite important for for productivity down the future, but how will we finance 